All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. Fantastic uh, human on today, but a band, I'm going to be talking about a band that I just heard about. And I feel like I'm late on the train because you guys have been around since like 2016 or so. And uh, somebody sent it over to me a couple of weeks ago and I heard this song Algorithmic and I was like, I got to have this nice. band on right away. And then it <laughs> turns out there's all kinds of cool shit around you guys. So uh, introduce yourself. Cool. Yeah, I'm uh, Mario Quintero from the band Spotlights. Spotlights. Uh, man, it's just, first of all, this uh, new record, what is it? Uh, Alchemy for the Dead. Yeah, I've been listening to it for the last couple of days, and it's just fantastic. Nice. It comes out, what, April 23rd? April 28th. Yeah. April 28th. Yep. And, uh, man, it is some dark shit. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that, man. It is uh, it is dark. It's like, you know, I mean, I feel like our, our music's kind of had a little bit of a, uh, we always kind of ride the line of, like, sort of some dark shit mixed in with a little bit of hopeful you know, kind of sound. Um, on this one, just kind of went for it. <laughs> went all the way in. Well, I mean, I'm always attracted to the very uh, dark music and there's uh, tons of uh, the theme of death is surrounded by this. And I recently lost my mom. And oh, wow. it, yeah, and it's been brutal. And I think that really what triggered for me is you constantly try to ignore death. Some people yeah. do. Some people glamorize yeah. it like, I can't wait till I die and I want to <laughs> die young, you know, that old thing. But, you know, for the most part, people, you know, because I'm a comedian and yeah. I'll do a joke about death and people will just be like, oh, whoa. They get weird. And you can feel the room go like, dude, we're here to escape, you know? Yeah. But it is an interesting thing that, um, that people do not want to talk about death. It's scary, right? Yeah, it's weird, man. That's kind of like part of the reason for the whole, the whole like theme of the record is just there's so many different takes on it. And, you know, we, most people, like you said, not everybody, but most people kind of are afraid of it. We look at it as like this, like scary thing. And then there's the opposite, like you said, as well with like people who are like, you know, like, it's just a beautiful part of life, man. It's cool. Like, you know, and the fact is like, no matter who you are, whether, how, however you look at it, like, you know, I guess for a personal, on a personal way, I'm kind of right in between. Like I, I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid of like dying. You know what I mean? Like what's going to happen? How much is it going to hurt? All that shit. Like, I, I think that's what most people are scared of anyway. You know, it's like whatever suffering or what, however it goes, you don't know. We don't know when or how it's going to happen. So it's like this, inevitable unknown that we all have to deal with well i think the the scary death is the slow hospital death 100 percent. that you know because i watched it happen and it's it's absolutely um it's brutal but i think the ultimate death is just in your sleep oh yeah agreed (laughs) <laughs> like if i had a choice and i hope i do <laughs> when i if i get to the point man when i'm laying in a bed and and i'm of the right mind enough to be like all right this is nothing it's not going to get better from here on out i'll do give me whatever so just put me down let me go to sleep and um, let's do it you know i always have this question for people i'm 57 how old are you i'm 46 Okay, 46. What if this was on the table for you? Uh Somebody came and said, I'm going to guarantee you 30 more years. Or you take the gamble and see what you get. What would you take? So I guess I would I would have one question. Like, do I know how it's going to happen at those at 76 or whatever? And if there's if I don't know, I'll take the gamble anyway. Because again, <laughs> yeah. you know. Well, I think the scariest part about knowing would be the last year. You're like, this is oh, yeah. the last fucking year. <laughs> right? Well, maybe that maybe that would make you maybe that would push you to fucking 
live like all the way, you know? Can you imagine you won the lottery on the last year? <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> You'd be like, come on, man. Can I buy a few more years? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Go back to the guy. Like, so I just won the lottery. <laughs> I love the sound of the band. And um, thanks, man. I, you know, I'm a big back in the day. I listened to the Swans a lot, a nice. lot of dark music. And, and of course, now you're on Mike Patton's label and, yeah. You know, one of the greatest records ever to come out of the Bay Area where I'm from is Angel Dust. A lot of oh, yeah. dark themes on that record. And Mike Patton being a huge, uh, obviously a fan of strange, outside the box, amazing music. Yeah. How does he come about working with you guys? Um, It's weird, man. I mean, I still still it still doesn't make sense to me because you know we're huge fans of his music and all his projects and and the label as a whole too uh it's funny when we first submitted to them our friend aaron harris uh who played drums in the band isis which was on ipecac as well uh he he got in touch with greg and was like you know he was producing the record seismic which was going to be the first one on it ended up being the first one on ipecac um and Greg right away, who's the, he's Mike Patton's manager, Greg Workman, uh, his manager and the owner of Ipecac. So it's basically a 50, 50 split between them for the, they, they started the label to put out all Mike's records that weren't. Phantom and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 Just everything because they didn't want to deal with major label bullshit. Um, but anyway, they, they have a pack basically where it's the, both of them have to agree on whether they would like a band to sign them. And uh, Greg right away was like, I love it. Let's do it. Uh, but, you know, I, I just don't think Mike is going to like it. <laughs> and uh, next day, he just sent us a text and was like, Mike's in. Let's do it. And uh, and it happened, man. So, And since then, you know, we've met a couple times, and he's been super supportive and just, you know, it's 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 weird. I don't I don't. You know, I don't know how or why, but we're super happy and, and uh, grateful to be on that label. Well, I don't think there's any better stamp of indie art than Mike Patton signing a band in my eyes or taking yeah. a band out on tour or any of that, because to me, he has the ultimate career. There's a few people in the world that have like this type of career where it's very vital that the fans grab what they're doing and are willing to take a ride from multiple different sounds and vibes. You know, Mike yeah. stuff is all over the board from oh, Bumble yeah. to Faith No More to Phantomos to anything that he's doing. Yeah. And so I think being on that label is just so amazing because the people it's a lot like early Def Jam or Def American when Ruben would sign something, whether it totally. be Johnny Cash Slayer or work with the Beastie Boys or anything, you took the ride because you trusted Rick. And that's a yep. lot like Mike Patton. You really will trust what Mike's, uh, you know, instincts and uh, taste are. Yeah. No, and it's it feels good. And I think, you know, for us, it ended up being the perfect place because... I don't know, people have trouble kind of pinning this down to like a specific genre or a specific sound or whatever. And I mean, I think unintentionally sort of been semi-fluid with what we do, even though I think we have a kind of a, maybe a quote unquote sound to the band. Um, and I think that's why it works. You know, it's not, <clears throat> it, it just, they are, they have everything on that label from like jazz to straight up thrash to math rock to noise rock to whatever you know classical basically um so it's nice to be somewhere where you're not just kind of like lumped into like oh this is a post metal band or a post rock band because you're on a certain label you know and yeah it gives label, us the freedom label, to do whatever label we by want. the label <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it happens it's crazy yeah and that's really like i mean as a musician, as an artist, as a fan or anything, like that's my biggest like 
concern with music really is like not being boring and not being stagnant really you know like don't get stuck in doing the same thing over again or feeling like you have to do the same thing over again because people think you you are part of this like uh, scene or genre or whatever you know um so it's awesome man like i it's like you said being having that stamp of approval kind of gives us the confidence to do whatever we want to do and it's just awesome the, the fact that they keep putting our records out is is crazy <laughs> to us yeah you know. it's it's absolutely fantastic to know that there's people out there that are going no way is this going to be on the radio right it, it's such a, a a weird world that you know where people just of course we know what it is it's the music business but it's that world of somebody understanding let's figure out how to put these records out and stay in business somehow and that yeah. key you know what i'm saying yeah no and i mean it's nice to see now because they've they've picked up a couple bands not necessarily new bands a couple new bands but um the label seems to kind of be like having a little bit of an upswing now too you know uh i think because things are a little freer now we're not so like pinned down by like radio or just major labels or you know the marketing and everything is a little more uh even these days especially with like streaming and all that shit so um it's good to see that they they can still survive and are doing you know from what i know relatively well as a label but they also do it smart you know they do it <clears throat> it's literally two people that run the label it's greg and mark shapiro who's like their main production manager he does everything basically he's he's an incredible guy and uh and you know mike is part of the label but he's mainly kind of an outside voice on on who they sign so and that's it so you know we get i get questions all the time about like ipecac or, or bands that are interested in being on the label or you know asking about it and people have an impression that it's kind of like this big this big thing but it's it's just two people that work their fucking asses off to make something cool happen. <laughs> is it out and of San Francisco? Um, yeah, initially is out of out of San Francisco. Greg actually moved recently, but uh, you know, the label still is basically based there. And Mark Shapiro lives in New York, which is where we we lived. We formed in New York. Yeah, you guys started in Brooklyn, and now you're out in Pittsburgh. What yeah. made that move happen? I know you're married to Sarah. It's a three-piece band. It's Sarah, you, and Chris on yep. drums. What made you move? Was it um, during COVID, a, a way to survive as artists, getting something cheap and being able to uh, record and be all in where you're at? Because I know you recorded the record at your house. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, all of the above, basically. But we did move before COVID. So we moved here 2018, like right at the end of 2018. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, but yeah, I mean, New York was just kind of like killing us, man, trying to be a small band like us, and touring a lot like we were at the time. Uh, coming home to, to Brooklyn with like, little or no money from a long ass tour. And then having to just non-stop hustle to pay rent it just wasn't feasible anymore you know and like barely barely possible really because like you know i couldn't really i had a job <clears throat> when i lived in brooklyn for a while working at a college doing just like audio visual shit and it paid relatively well like anywhere else it would have been a great salary but in new york it just disappeared <laughs> yeah but you know and then we started touring a lot and i just eventually couldn't hold down the job anymore and then come back i was just doing sound at uh venues and whatever you know just the constant hustle to make it work which we're we're all about and we don't mind doing it but when you're doing that putting all your effort into that and you can barely pay your rent and barely just like you know we weren't going out we weren't getting anything out of new york we couldn't even go out to like shows anymore because you'd have to just an uber to st vitus is you know, $50. And then on the way back, like, that's just, it was unattainable. What we wanted to do with the band wasn't going to happen there. So, uh, how did you so, pick yeah, Pittsburgh? Uh, pretty randomly, really just from touring. Every time we came through here, we really liked it visually. It's a beautiful city. 
people were always cool and um when we finally started trying to look at places to get out of new york we were thinking we wanted to stay kind of close just because to kind of keep the you know we have a lot of friends there and chris still lives there chris our drummer still lives there so so, uh we were looking like upstate new jersey etc and even there everything was already all blown out um so we just remembered like pittsburgh school let's check that out and it was like insane how cheap it was compared to new york obviously yeah uh and we just went for it man like we we didn't know anybody here whatsoever just uh came out here for a weekend looked at houses and rented a place and moved out here i love that i love that just like <laughs> fuck it let's go for it man hell yeah yeah, yeah. Tell, I mean, tell, me, tell me how much that rent is for the house oh dude well the one we moved into was a two-bedroom house with like a giant yard it was 900 bucks a month wow yeah which and i mean people here were like yeah it's getting expensive right i'm like what the fuck are you talking about 900 so, yeah and then during covid we were able to buy a house which is something i didn't i never even thought would happen in my life you know yeah i've i grew up in florida and miami and then i moved to boston which was crazy expensive then i moved to san diego which is insanely expensive and then new york so like to me that was that's how much things cost you know a piece of trash house in a shitty neighborhood cost six hundred thousand dollars so <laughs> but yeah. here uh we we bought a house for 90 grand the one 90 grand there. yeah what, and it was grand. And, and it's a, a nice that's house a car, that's a car and and, and a, like a used <laughs> that's a used uh mercedes exactly so we were like because we yeah we during covid we were just like just started kind of poking around and seeing what was what the deal was with uh house prices and i was just like holy shit so yeah, we were able to buy a house. We have a, a yard. We have, you know, it's a nice like little two bedroom house. I had this basement that I was able to build out. So now I have a proper, it's small. Like I would, you know, obviously it's it's not everything I would want. But again, my mortgage is like $700 a month. That's incredible. <laughs> I love I love hearing that, right? You the know? Quality, yeah, like the quality of life, man. Just your your stress levels, everything goes down and like that i think opened up a lot of space for just being able to be more inspired to work and make music and and not only music but like my recording work started getting much better because i could i could kind of like sit back and wait for work to come in instead of just constantly being stressed out and pushing and you know like bothering people trying to be like hey hey you want to record you want to record we're like I just think that doesn't work in that industry really, you know? Yeah. Kinda it's, it's a word of mouth thing and people have to start coming to you, you know? Yeah. It, it's really wild. I was just out at Rancho de la Luna, you know, Dave oh, nice. studio. Yeah. <clears throat> and you was, know, uh, was a guy named John Russo. You know, the, the producer. Yeah. He's an engineer there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, the guy from what, what England or whatever. No, no, no. He's he's a he's, he lives out there, like in Joshua Tree. Oh no, really cool it's, dude. I worked with them for a while. Sorry. <laughs> they had a dude from uh, England there. Fuck, I forget oh, it because nice. I'm just old. But <laughs> but <clears throat> my point is, he moved out yeah. there like 30 years ago and started yeah. that studio. And here they are celebrating their 30 year anniversary this year. And you know, to think about it's it's really wild to think about the old days where you had to be in new york or la or a scene like let's say seattle right. was happening or <clears throat> detroit or something you know sure and now with music and social media and and uh home recordings and how great everything sounds which by the way your record sounds fantastic thanks man you can really live anywhere and it's kind of knocked down that wall of, uh, you know, people are like, well, we got to be in New York and it's so expensive. Man, yeah. I follow this cheap old houses on Instagram and I'm like, well, look <laughs> at this house for 40 grand. And if I was playing music back in the day when I played music, we had a band house, you know? Right. I'm right. thinking, well, like a $40,000 house or 90, like you're saying, 
Yeah. We could buy a house and all live in it and just go crazy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. I mean, and yeah, like if, you know, it's a, I think it's a plus, like I'm all for like home recording and people getting into that shit just because that's how it is. Like I try and embrace it, even though it's my job. Uh, I feel like it's helped my job. I feel like bands can record themselves at home and then I, I mostly mix records anyway. So like, and it's really what I enjoy doing the most. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the thing where like, you know, you can kind of learn how to record and it's a little easier to do, but the mixing part, it takes a long time to get to that point where, you you know, I've been doing it for 25 years and I'm still just like scratching the surface. I feel like, you know, um, so it's actually helped because so many bands are able to record without having to spend thousands of dollars on a studio, get relatively decent tracks. And then they send them to me and I, I have something decent to work with, you know? Yeah. Now, let's get into how you start. <clears throat> how do you uh, start Spotlights? And what was this your first band? And what was the initial influences? Like, what were you listening to to get into this? Were you into like Nine Inch Nails and Ministry and all of this? Or, or what guides you into this, you know, instead of just being, hey, here we are, a rock band, you know? Um, I mean, we never really like spotlights itself. I've, I've played in a bunch of other bands and Sarah and I actually played in a band before spotlights when we lived in San Diego. Um, but this band, the point of it really was for us to just do something for Sarah and I to do something that like, we didn't, we didn't have to like, we weren't going for any specific sound. It was just like, let's make what we want to hear. Like basically form our favorite band that's what that's what the goal was to like make something that we wish other people were making um so there wasn't necessarily like and i do love nine inch nails and ministry and uh, tons of other bands uh you know i we both have a lot of deep influences i think but there wasn't anything in particular where like we were like okay i want to be kind of a heavy band that sounds like this it was right. just we just started kind of playing and not holding back whatever was coming out so like at the beginning it was really kind of more electronic <clears throat> i was playing drums and sarah was playing bass and uh we even played a few shows like that but uh i'm just more of a guitar player so i started writing more guitar stuff and eventually it just made sense to get a drummer and we ended up forming kind of what it is now but for for all of the records and even especially now like the the new record we've we've never gone into we've actually gone into it trying not to have a specific influence you know trying not to be like uh you know we've been listening to so and so a lot which i'm i'm not a big music listener like I, i'm kind of maybe it's because i'm working on music a lot or whatever but i'm just i'm not caught up on like what's happening new or anything like that i basically listen to the same bands i've been listening to for since i was like 15 who are those bands? Uh, I mean, it, you know, it varies, but uh, a huge one. I grew up basically listening to like The Cure, Depeche Mode, New Order, things like that to begin Joy with. Joy Division. Not not too much Joy Division, really, but yeah. It, kind of a weird mix. So I had two older sisters and they had super diverse tastes as well. And I would just raid their tape collections and record collections. Um. So it was a mix of that. And then, you know, when I was about 12 or 13, starting to get into, I was skateboarding. And so like I started getting into punk rock. So bands like Bad Brains and Fugazi and a little later, you know, more like post hard rock stuff like uh, like Helmet, Quicksand, bands like that. Um, all mixed in with more like older new wave stuff. I think that was kind of like my molding when I was young. And it's still it's still there bands like uh jane's addiction like early jane's addiction was a huge one for me Dixies, uh yeah that, that's like me. i mean you know when you're growing up in the 70s and 80s there's kind of like you're just into all kinds of stuff you know one of my yeah. favorites of course is devo and gary newman and oh, i've been yeah. both on the show and and these people amazing 
were just mind boggling and craft work. They, I, I'd play them at the same time I would play ACDC. You Hell know, yeah. there were no rules. So, yep. yeah, yeah, I get it, man. It's just a, a, it was a plethora of just incredible music that was all over the board. Yep. Yeah. And, and I mean, especially once Lollapalooza hits, you know? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Like first Lollapalooza, I I didn't get to go to the first one. I went to the second one. But I mean, that lineup for the first one was was amazing, you know? Well, the second it, one was insane. The second one was good, too. Ministry was there. Ice Cube. Yeah, it was like Ice Cube, Soundgarden, Soundgarden. Jam. Oh, unreal. Uh, ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. But but yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's like we do love music. We're just not we're not we're like a weird kind. Of, at least I'm like a weird type of music fan. You know, I'm not I don't really go searching out new bands or anything. Uh, friends send me stuff all the time. And and sometimes I dig it, even if I really dig it. It's hard for me to kind of become like a a new fan of, of something unless it really just blows my mind somehow you know if it has has to have something real specific to like draw me in um so yeah i don't i don't really there wasn't any specifics influences that that really made this band what it is that i you know i'm of course there is like i think everything around us influences us all the time uh it's just it's hard to pinpoint something down man i'm i'm telling you i do this show and in one week i heard this band the machine and then you guys and uh, weekly it seems like this happens to me i'm like holy shit this is great i mean awesome. i can't even i just heard this uh group uh was uh eve's tumor okay. they got five records out never even heard of them unreal <laughs> you know so yeah the amount of great music out there is so mind-boggling to me it is and and people say it's hard to keep up it is but i just keep notes in my itunes or my amazon music and yeah. i constantly make sure that i go and listen to these again and not just listen to them one week and never hear them again you know right, right. so the amount of great music out there is just insane it is. It's crazy, man. It's uh, I think it's awesome. You know, I, you know, streaming and all that shit gets a bad rap and there's a reason for it, of course, but I've just, especially for bands like us who've, it's a struggle to, you know, I don't know, we're just a, a small band and it takes a lot of work for us to like build little bits of a fan base little by little year after year and touring our asses off to like get to a place where it's sustainable. Um, but it's just, it's awesome for everybody to have the platform now, you know, that didn't exist before. No. Yeah. When I was, when I was in bands, and streaming, when I was, you know, and sound yeah. and band camp. And I mean, yeah. shit, dude, it's, it's, it also makes it hard because there's so sure. much out there that people are like, uh, you know, open up like SoundCloud and you're like, oh, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> yeah. But I think, and I truly believe in this and I've said it over and over, the uh, power of word of mouth is um, it's uh, it's stronger than anything and it's underrated. I mean, you know, people totally. tell me about something and I trust that person's music taste and I listen to it and go, Tam, dude, that shit's great. Or yeah. I tell people about music on this show and right. they go, wow, that was great, you know, or they don't like it or whatever, but the power yeah of word of mouth still needs to be out there for these all these new bands in, in order for Agreed. it to work because don't you see i know you see it and i see it i've been a comedian now on my 14th year it's wow. real slow the um the uh each year you're like okay i've got like you know a couple hundred more people at, at a venue yeah or whatever it's right. mind-boggling but it, it could just take one thing and as corny as it sounds a viral video or chino marino or right. Mike Patton championing you you know with me as bill burr people right. going you know him going hey go see this guy or touring with him and that is the shit 
that starts to spread and uh, and keep you going too, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it keeps you know it's it's inspiring and like it gives you the confidence to be like, all right, well, maybe I do have something, and and keeps you going. And you know, I think, and you probably know this just as well, like having those opportunities to open for these amazing people and these amazing bands. It's it's such a it's such a cool thing. It's a huge like one of those like bucket list things. So like that for me is really what I've gotten out of those things. And then after it's over, you have to fucking work. Like that's oh. when you have to work. Yeah. You know, because because, oh, yeah. yeah, you've been on a tour playing state or not stadiums, but like, let's say arenas or uh, theaters, whatever it is. And then you come home and you're like, all right, now let's let's go on a headline tour. And it's like, oh, OK, now there's 10 people here again. <laughs> so it, you really I, have to just use it's Sorry, amazing you say that dude because i was just talking to somebody about this because they're always like hey man how come you're not here or there you know right. and as i did this arena tour with bill all last year yeah um amazing it, you know we got we had 12 to fifteen thousand people in the room we're still fighting against add yep because people will go, I love this guy or this band. And the next day they don't even remember. Yeah. So it almost takes a next level type of fan that goes, hold on, let me follow these guys on Instagram and let me go to their website and see where they're playing next. And let me buy yeah. a shirt. It totally takes, because the, the, you know, Mike Patton and Chino and these guys can open the door for you. And you can kill it, but it's still a responsibility of the non-ADD fan to go, let me write this down real quick yep. before I forget. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's basically they open the door to a hallway and you have to keep walking through that thing until, you know, I don't think there really is an end, but like, that's what a lot of people don't, don't seem to get. Like we, you know, we're, we're a really small, small band. <laughs> like. Yeah. And I'm you a know, real small had, comedian in the in the in the spectrum. Of right it. in the scheme of the whole thing, it's totally. like just because we have those opportunities doesn't mean like all of a sudden we're raking it in and killing it at shows, and you know we're doing better for sure. But it's been you know we toured with Deftones in 2016, so it's been what eight years now almost, and we're still just like barely you know selling out like a hundred cap room. I <laughs> hear you. Dude, it's, I could relate. I would. So I, hard. <laughs> I never thought it would happen to me. So like, that's fucking awesome. And I take everything with gratitude, dude. If like ten people show up and they're into it and they're real fans, that's what's important to me. You know. Same here. And I, we've also like avoided, not avoided, but I guess we're just not those people. Like, I think some bands and artists or whatever can can have sort of like a stick that hits and works, and they capitalize on that real quick. And you see a lot of those things go up fast. You know, they get a million followers all of a sudden. They hit this big kind of moment. But then it just kind of like fades away. Where like, my hope is to keep keep building those 10 true real fans over and over and over again until, you know, until whatever. Like, un yeah. there's not really a goal for it. It's just I. what's important is that the people that are there are are actually there for you, not because it's the cool thing to do you know right right it, it it's that old saying of watch out where you get famous for also cuz some yep. people will jump on to some kind of coattails type of sound right and it's really not even what they're into or they don't even know what they're into and sure. then at the end of the day they get famous or big or something but then they crash and it was all on something they're not even into Yep. And then they try something later on and people are like, ah, man, you suck now. You're <laughs> whatever. So yeah, it, yeah. It, it is a, uh, it is a grind and I've never seen more of a grind than, um, a, a, a small band or a comedian starting out and trying to keep it going. Yeah. And, and I think to most people, they think it's all about monetary rewards. But like you said, when I show up at a club and there's 50 people there to see me, I'm fucking excited, man. Cause Hell those yeah. people I don't know, 
And I flew somewhere and was like, wow, these guys paid to come see me. This is cool. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, we know how hard it is to get out of the house and like, like you said, like keep, keep tabs on things and be interested in something enough to like be a fan, to be a real fan. So each one means so much, man. It's good. I can't even imagine in comedy, like you guys, I don't know, but it's, it has to be harder than being a musician. Well, it's easier because you don't deal with band members. That well, that's true. That's and true. And you don't have sound checks, so it's definitely right. easier that way. But it's way harder as a performer because you don't have any yeah. next year, like right. you know, hey, play a solo. I'm like, you know, <laughs> yeah, what? or even like an instrument to like right. you know hide behind or whatever. Like some people do, I guess. But like, yeah, it's I admire it so much, man. It's it's insane. I also had no idea. I. I did. I looked you up just before this, actually, just to check it out. I need interviews or whatever. And uh, you you have some fucking pipes, man. I heard you singing on stage and Bill Burr playing drums, which I had no idea was a thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I played music 25 years and it was my life, you know? Yeah. That's um, awesome. And now I do comedy and it, it's. I always say I took the long way around to get to comedy because comedy is what I should have been doing my whole life. Right. And uh, I love music and I love everything about it. But now that I'm out of music, I like it even more, you know, because awesome. I uh, I can sit back and, and not think about something like, well, who signed them or what producer did that record or listen to these tones or this song to me, it's yeah. just songs you know yeah you have like an outside a uh, more like objective view on everything i think yeah. that's what makes it that makes it tough for me to like get into new bands too like i was saying earlier i think i'm just kind of also being an engineer and and, and a mixer every time i hear a band the first thing I, I i don't do it on purpose but my ear just picks starts picking things apart not necessarily in a judgmental way but that's just that's what i start to pay attention to you know so if right. it's got like a weird snare drum I have a hard time liking the record. <laughs> you know, oh, whatever. Oh, Things like that. It's not just... like one of those Saint Anger Metallica. Yeah. Oh, oh, Jesus Christ. Man, that Lars snare. I'm like, yeah, with me, I'm like, I don't, I'm not even listening to the snare. And I played I music all my life. What are you? Yeah. I'm listening to the song, man. It's so crazy. I Dude, know. I can't believe his guitar tone. I'm like, who gives a fuck? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, you're right. Who gives a fuck? It doesn't matter. Like, yeah. Listen I, to really that Fugazi stuff, man. It's just oh, like, yeah. you know, just all distorted and ran into super raw. Yeah, wow. super raw. <laughs> and, you know, now now it's funny because you get people who are like, we want it to sound like that. And it's like, well, all right. <laughs> just yeah. don't, don't try too hard and you'll don't have any money. I mean, be, a, be a great band and don't have money. Yeah. But, Let me ask you, are you a comedy fan? Yeah, huge comedy fan. That's cool, man. That's cool. Do you do you go see uh, stand up at all? Mm, not as much as I'd like to. We recently there's a. Do you know that it's it's like a? I found it on Instagram, but it's don't tell comedy. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, pop -ups. We, we went, yeah, we went to one of their shows here in Pittsburgh recently, and it was awesome. But uh, well, yeah, I just like I'm a terrible comedy fan, really, because we haven't we haven't made it to as many shows as we'd like to, but. We both Sarah and I love it, and we, you know, constantly looking for like specials on Netflix or wherever they are, or even on Instagram. Most of my Instagram is just like either like recording stuff or comedy stuff. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. something that I think is really cool. I don't know if it's good for you guys or not, but it's the exposure to it's like Spotify, same thing. Like I've never seen so many comics in my life until like the last couple of years it seems like there's just like or maybe i just caught on to it recently but there's so many so many people who are hilarious on instagram and you know i keep finding every day it's like somebody new that i like so yeah. maybe it's not music for me but it's comedy so it's like the opposite you know yeah i think that uh like i said social media uh being a double-edged sword uh, a yep. total demon and also a necessary and good tool you know sure. it just yeah. um i i i also think about the slippery slope of where i saw the music business go where you know you're giving away your stuff yeah. and 
hoping that people come to the live shows yeah. and you, you got to really watch out for that. You know, like here's my special for free and you know, yeah. 2000 views on something that you uh, worked your ass off and it's not necessarily, it's, it's not uh, a bad special, but it didn't hit the algorithm. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, so man. then you're like, it, 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 there's no bigger demon than that. And that can really set someone down, especially when the industry is looking at numbers and they're like, well, his special only got 2000 views. And it's like, yeah, but is it good? Do yeah. you think it? Is it funny? Then figure out how to get them to the another level, you know, and same thing with music out there. You know, the totally. algorithm is just fucking crazy. It is, man. It's the worst. It's the worst part of it, you know, and I, not even the algorithm itself, but how it fucks people up like you said like you know we're so concerned about the numbers and the perception and the image of of like you're not even people don't even worry about the product anymore they're like well is it numbers or you know like yeah but i i do think there's a level at there's kind of a fine line to ride there and again we've kind of tried i i really just don't give a shit about that so like we've we've kind of made sure that like everybody who likes that page is somebody who actually liked that page and really is like into the music. And, and it's crazy. Like we, it's been so organic, I think because of that. And we haven't like, you know, started a TikTok and done the shit that you're supposed to do. And the, you know, like if we had a social media manager, they would have us doing all kinds of other shit that we, we wouldn't want to do. Right. Um, Cause I'm not just shooting for numbers. Like, I would rather have 500 followers on Instagram and have all those 500 people show up at shows than have, you know, which I've seen it happen. I mean, I've, we've, we've toured with bands where I've seen this happen where like they'll have a hundred plus thousand followers on Instagram and nobody's coming to the shows, you know? Yeah. Well, perfect example. I've got 70,000 Instagram fans and I'll put a video up and I'll have about, you know, 2000 likes. So the numbers don't mean shit. Right. I tell people that all the time. Yeah. Do you like the record? Do you like the comedy? And exactly. that's what means the most to me is like, I'm doing this for me. And if somebody else digs it, then fucking cool. But I'm not going to stop because I didn't get a million views on YouTube. Yeah. You know what I'm know. saying? I've been doing this show for 11 years. Yeah. And, you know, almost... Uh, 700 episodes and it's uh crazy it's a a personal like fulfillment of pleasure to me of like talking to people like you or the biggest star ever that i loved growing up say yeah being you know acdc or uh josh homie from queens of the stone age or right or you know fucking gene simmons whatever it is <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. This is, I, I started this in a in a studio apartment and it's been going 11 years and you know people from around the world hit me up daily love this show and it's fucking wild like that's what's i feel like that's what's more important when you get those messages from people you know like yeah. real fans where they're like man like i love your i love what you do and it's real and genuine it doesn't matter how many it's like the fact yeah. that that person took time to do that is, is huge. Especially you could be having a bad day and the, yeah. the fan does not even understand how much that fueled your fucking tank that day. Yeah. You get up, you're like, God, man. And then you get an email, dude, I had a hard time during COVID, but your oh, yeah. music got me through it. I just wanted to let you know, I wanted to take the time to let you know. And you're like, whoa i got enough yeah. gas to go through this day now you know yeah man hell yeah it's amazing i love it it's like that's that's really what makes it worth it you know i have no like aspirations to be some fucking rich famous rock star all i all we want as a band even just to like we just want to be able to break even and pay our bills and and you know not not struggle a little bit less yeah <laughs> like that's yeah that's like me all i want to do is work yeah, I love doing this. Like we we'll do it whether we're getting paid or not, but it's it's if we're putting this much effort into it, you kind of unfortunately have to make a little money. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I love that. <laughs> ah, you, you fucking guys sold out, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I sold out. I was able to get some gas and uh, right in an out burger today. <laughs> oh, seriously, dude. I know. How did how does uh, Chino find it? Does he hear you or does he see you live somewhere? How did that happen? So that was insane, man. That was. Uh, I mean, we were barely a band. That was our, we had just put out our first single um, on a tiny little label. Like basically we were splitting everything with the label uh, and, and we put out our first single. It was, it streamed on Brooklyn Vegan and uh, it just seemed like people were into it. It was doing pretty good. And our friend Aaron Harris, again, who ended up producing our second record Seismic, he, uh, he was Abe's drum tech. So Abe from the drummer from Deftones, his drum tech um aaron has done a lot for us man just he's he's a super good friend and he's always kind of trying to spread the word uh but this was again we barely existed as a band he wrote me when when he heard the song and was like dude this is awesome uh didn't say anything else was just like stoked on it and i sent him the rest of the record so he could hear it and the next day we got an email from uh an agent like we didn't even know i almost almost deleted it because it looked like spam it was like you know so and so whatever agency and then it said hey i represent a large rock band um they want to know if you're available to tour next summer wow and i was like this is like a, a large rock band really delete you know yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> like how much do you need how much do you want me to pay you for whatever like yeah um but we looked into it. we were like he was with caa and then i was like wait i feel like i've heard of that and we look it up and look him up and he represents like all these big bands that we're fans of and um sure enough so i write back and like he writes back he's like all right uh well it's opening for deftones and refused here are the dates uh and we're just like you know it's one of those moments where you're like what like that's huh that's so uh, cool. yeah and so i hit aaron up right away i'm like dude what did you have anything to do with this and he's like why what happened and uh I'm like, we just got offered a tour with Deftones. And he's he's like, oh, I didn't. He's like, I showed it to Chino, but I didn't say anything. Right? I didn't, like, ask him to do anything. Um, so he passed that song on to Chino. And then, and then he was like, he found out that they offered us the tour. I mean, this happened, like, within, like, three days. It was crazy. Um, so we sent Chino the rest of the record, and he was into it. And, yeah, we ended up doing the tour. And, again, I mean, at that point like talking about numbers and instagram bullshit we had i i think we had like 550 followers on instagram wow when that happened wow <laughs> you know it's funny is man Crazy. i've been chino for years i ran into him like a year ago just walking through i was going to look at an apartment for rent and nice. he was just walking through uh the same neighborhood i was out and i hadn't seen this guy in 30 years and he goes Dino Ray. and i was like whoa man <laughs> so weird but That's the amazing. great thing about deftones and tool of course is just giant but these type of bands that were really just a hardcore following and can work the rest of their lives and they constantly put out good music and are yeah. constantly you know just <clears throat> able to just survive on on their art which is amazing yeah. oh it's awesome man it's it's an inspiration for sure and it's really cool when when you get an offer like that you never know what it's going to be like like when you show up and if like we don't we didn't feel like we belonged there yet we didn't we were like what the fuck are we doing here but first day they all were just like buddies they were just like what's up you know that's friends great. right away and didn't treat us like anything different they were just we felt 100 percent comfortable right away and so that first show all those nerves kind of like melted away and i it just felt like we were we were supposed to be here you know it took a while to obviously really learn how to like <laughs> i mean it was this was literally our first tour as as spotlights we had done a little bit of touring before in other bands but nothing like this you know yeah um, so it was like kind of like oh here you go and just getting thrown into our first show was in front of like four thousand people yeah uh, in your 40s too that's what i love you're like yeah. in your 40s and you're yeah. like me like late in life and you're like well and which makes it great because you're like oh, i'm ready for this now 
You know? Hell yeah, I would have fucked that up if I was 22 and that happened. I would have, I would have done something stupid or like gotten yeah. too drunk the first night and gotten kicked off the tour. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know? Well, I'm fired up. I'm getting ready to see you guys May 11th at the Palladium with uh, Bungle and Melvin's. Nice. Uh, I've, I've I've been uh, friends with Scott Ian and Dave Lombardo for years and years. Uh, I've awesome, been man. a giant fan of Mike Patton. It was funny, Mike Patton. Uh, I, I saw him uh, backstage at a show. I knew he was going to say no, but I had to ask him anyway because I've been a fan of his all my life. So I was like, "Hey, man, I know you're going to say no, but uh, I'd love to have you on the podcast sometime." And he's like, <laughs> I knew yeah. it. And that's one of the reasons I love Mike Patton because of his mystique, which right. is unbelievable. But there is a, a thing there where you have to ask, because if you could actually tap that brain of, of Mike Patton and, and just really hear uh, what's ticking in there, it'd be great. But yeah, seriously, I'm fired up. And also I love the Melvins. I've had buzz and everybody on from the Melvins on the show. Nice. I had all three. And uh, that's going to be a fantastic tour. Uh, yeah, I'm looking man. forward to that. And are you guys looking forward to that or what? Oh, yeah, dude, we're stoked. I mean, we're we're not only just excited to get back out on the road because it's been like two years. We've done a couple tours since COVID, but just little like week long things. Uh, we're doing two months this time and a solid, I think it's 10 or 11 shows are with Bungle and Melvin. So, I mean, that's it's everything like i said it's like it's not even about the like like fame will do for us it's like the experience you know getting to we've toured with the melvins before and we and we played one of the bungle shows when they when they played in new york when they did a few one-offs yeah um so like we've met them and we know you know but it's still just it's a little mind-blowing and it's it's just as exciting um melvins are a huge influence for us not only musically but like going back to to doing things the right way those guys have been doing this for 30 plus years at this point and they could be they could have two buses if they wanted to on tour you know and they could be shooting for like bigger rooms and whatever but they've kept it like buzz is so smart the way he sets things up he's like they're still in a van in a sprinter sometimes he even still drives because he just likes to do it super minimal crew no bullshit no like you know he trimmed all the fat and just do the work just fucking work and they make a really great living off of being able to do what they've been doing for the last 30 something years you know yeah man people like buzz could you know they could write books on business that you would Seriously. read you know like really lay it down of like here's the pitfalls here's where you're going to lose money here's where you're going to make money Yep. Uh, here's some of the, uh, you know, the, the ins and outs of merch and, and, and equipment and, and text and sound, what you need, what you don't need. It would be yeah. a, a, a Bible of somebody like buzz, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy, man. You know, the, the amount of money that gets thrown around on these tours that, and then people complain about not making money, which drives me crazy. You know, you're like, well, did you really need a lighting person? Like, to to just fucking put up a couple like you know especially if you're just a rock band i right. get it if you're a DJ, if you're a dj or something and that's your show but like riders people you know you'll be a headline band putting a bunch of shit on your rider and then you're like well wait what you know <laughs> yeah you're paying for that rider that's your, that's your money man like <laughs> that's one thing buzz stuff. always says like i don't need somebody to shop for me like i can go get my own food i'm a fucking grown up you know yeah. give me the cash give me some water I can go do the rest, you know? Yep. I, I always say just have <laughs> some fresh fruit and some Topo Chico's back there and I'm ready to fucking go. Boom. Exactly. That's all I'll go mean. eat after something. Yeah. Clean. <laughs> it's crazy. Sometimes the amount of, and not only like that, but the waste, like just picnic tables of fucking food that get thrown right yeah. in the trash afterwards. You know? Fucking crazy. That's well, look, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you. I'll see you Same, uh, man. backstage and uh, let's shoot the shit and hang out. The Palladium is a prestigious, beautiful room. Yeah, uh, I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to knock you out. And that Bungle Melvin's lineup is right up there with Mastodon Gojira for me, you know. Just great lineups this summer coming, coming up. up. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, and man. I'm hoping to catch that. <clears throat> 
And uh, look, like I said, looking forward to meeting you. The record comes out April 28th. The band is Spotlights. Yeah. Record is called Alchemy for the Dead. And it's fantastic. And I, so I much, immediately fell in love with the sound and the vibe of the band. I can't wait to see you guys. And uh, thanks for doing the show, man. Thanks for having me on, man. This was a pleasure. Really appreciate it. No Instagram? You got an Instagram? Uh, yeah, we have an Instagram. It's Spotlights Music. And uh, my recording Instagram is Audio MQ. Right on. And yep. uh, are you all Pro Tools? You use all Pro Tools? Uh, mostly, yeah. I use Ableton for the live stuff, but for all the recording stuff and mixing usually on Pro Tools. It's incredible how good Pro Tools sounds now. I just heard the new Metallica record, you know? Yeah. And it is just like, remember the old days? It was just flat and pr and compressed. Yeah. Like shit, the guitars were all bunk. I mean, <laughs> this shit sounds unreal now. It's crazy. I mean, I think most of it really, what it came down to was people learning to use it you know what i mean because it's just a different medium like learning really the digital the actual software hasn't changed much like some of the fidelity has but even when it was at the lowest fidelity it was still higher fidelity than tape was it's more just tape tape did a certain thing it was like having your own having a compressor on each track already but now all of a sudden you don't so things have to like they fall in different places and it took it took a long time to for people to learn how to use digital i think i i was lucky when when i started recording when i was like 18 19 i came from four tracks and i had done a little bit of tape recording like in studios and small studios but uh it it was just it was right when pro tools was starting to happen so i caught the very beginning of it and the tail end of of analog you know so i wasn't really stuck in either place it was a little bit right. easier for me to start learning but I mean, nowadays it's, you have no excuse really, <laughs> which is, you just gotta be, you know, you gotta put in the work at this point. Well, also you can just go to YouTube and learn from these nerds that are like, oh, okay, you go here and you find a bat, 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 and you go, okay, right? oh, I got this. I would have killed for that. That's, oh God, can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, I remember recording on ADATs, you know? Yep. And oh, just yeah. going like, well, I mean, it sounds like shit, but it's free. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. like, it's nuts, man. It's nuts. But um, uh, can people contact you about mixing their records? Yeah. If you go to audiomq.com is my website. I got all my info there. And, and I think I have a couple of links to spotlights too. So it all kind of goes through there. Great. Great. Yeah. Great talking to you, man. And Thanks uh, so much, great Dean. to see you. Yeah, man. You as well. Thank you so much for doing the show, and I will see you soon, my man.